every other person ever that's everywhere is also a weak pussy because it's the same thing. That if there's any addiction that everybody has right now, it's this thing. How many times a day can you if, if I move away from this desk, I'll pick this up and look at my notifications. I will. The Move Entrepreneur Evolved Podcast. Get on it. And we made it back to the Moved Entrepreneur Evolved Podcast. I'm super excited for our guest, Cody Getchell. What is up, man? You made oh, it. Wow. We talked about this and we're here. Yeah, I'm pumped. I'm pumped to be on it, dude. I'm always happy to, to spread some knowledge and uh, yeah, dive into it. Dude, I was I was going to say the lighting on that uh, camera you got going there. How much time did that take, man? It came out really good. This is literally, uh, I just, I happen to have a uh, like 12 foot ceiling and it's mm-hmm. all, you know, so this is natural. I have soft lights. I threw them away. So the camera setup's decent, but it's really, it's all the natural light. Normally, honestly, it's better than this, but it's been raining for what, like four months, I feel like in Vancouver. So can't get away from it. Well, I'll, I'll follow the Joe Rogan every once in a while, and he'll have to actually talk to the guests and be like, hey, can you pull the mic a little further? So I'm going to have to let you know that your camera is this way. Mm-hmm. So to make sure you, you look at the camera, because then you're going to you're going to later on, you're going to be like, bro, why didn't you tell me? I didn't I, I'm not cross eyed. So I had to at least let you know. So, uh, you, yeah. you know, every once in a while, this is this is where your eyeball is. But, man, it's really it's really good to see you, man. Um, I always try to, like, go back a little bit and I'm going to go ahead and pull back just a little bit. And something that you had said, I wanted to bring this up right away because I think that this helps people um, with communication, uh, with dealing with culture. But it was a while back and you said you met a monk and he asked <laughs> questions on meditation. Yeah. What, so in the, what was in the, going on in that time? The pre-pandemic version of my life involved a lot of traveling. Um, and, and I don't like to I'm not a traveler who likes to just like uh, go for three days and say, OK, cool, I'm done. Right? That's, that's not how I like to do it. So we went to Europe for three months. Um, and then a year after that, we went to Thailand um, and a couple other small places, Laos, and went to Beijing for a minute for like a two month area. During that time, I am, uh, yeah, I went to a forest monastery, weird enough. I, I asked the Thai people, first of all, nicest people ever met. You ever been to Thailand? I lived there over a year. Oh, there you go. So you know what I'm talking about. They they know that their industry is run by by tourism, right? And some of them are just like some some countries you go in and they're like, ah, oh, man, man, get the hell out of my country. These guys are all super friendly, do everything. And so we're at this Airbnb, and I asked them, I'm like, is there a, a monastery that I can go where I can talk to to the monks where they won't you know feel like I'm just some random tourist being an asshole? And she's like, yes, go here on this map. It's outside of the tour. We're in Chiang Mai, if you know where that area is. It's up, mm-hmm. up north. It's a little quieter. Um, gave me literally her moped. She's like, here, just take take my shit. She was, I was like, I'm going to go rent one. She's like, no, no, just here. Puts a helmet on me, sits me on the thing, says, go. Like, okay, I'm going to be gone all day. She's like, all right, that's fine. Tells me the exact directions. It's like 30 minutes up into these mountains. She's like, there's English speaking monks out there and they're super friendly. Okay. I get there. I track one down and he's from like... Uh, Brazil or something randomly. He's just there and he's from a different place and he walks around with me and he teaches me some meditation techniques. I do a lot of stuff, you know, as an entrepreneur, I, 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 I pride myself on the fact that I've never done the whole burnout thing. If you guys have been paying attention to the space, lots of people have been quitting lately, selling their businesses, mm-hmm. doing this, that, the other, and blaming stress, right? Mm-hmm. One of the yeah, ways that yeah. I do that is I meditate every day. Um, yeah. And then that monk gave me some really good shit that the real, the best tip he gave me really though, was, you know, most people can't meditate because they fight, they fight their thoughts. Their whole thought of what meditation should be is you sit and you try and clear your mind. And that ends up being a struggle because, you know, you have thoughts that come into your head and you're trying to push them out. You're spending the entire time, instead of being calm, struggling against your own, your own mind and, and fighting against the thoughts that have It's like, if you just let them flow, one into another and just let your brain naturally calm itself down by allowing the thoughts that you've been trying to hold back by concentrating on other stuff to go through, you'll find clarity, not only in the thoughts that you're having, but also being able to to ease the noise eventually by just getting out of it and eventually calms itself. And I found that really interesting because that was always a big struggle for me when I was trying to do that. Yeah, I thought there was some real good common ground there. Uh, I spent about three months with a monk myself in Thailand. And um, the the conversation you just said was very, very true. Uh, The statement that I heard, which was pretty cool, is just the goal is to just be. Mm -hmm. And I think that was such a hard concept for us over here, at least in the West, because we feel like we always have to do. And I think, uh, you know, I I thought, you know, get your take on it, because I, I believe and I encourage other people as well to incorporate a sense of meditation into 
their business model. And I think that you nailed it. And that is that they're always trying to manage those thoughts. And I think that meditation also, I think you would agree that it's not about managing them at all. It's allowing them just to be what they are. So you incorporate that. Do you have a time that you do? Um, do you have yeah. A- so I, I am, um, I've never been the 5 a.m. guy. I, I hate people that try and push, you know, do I don't this like meditation. Anymore, morning, yeah. I'm like, eh. so I'm, I, I get up, I get up, I, 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 I have a morning routine. And so it depends on what time of year. So I, I have a, I live at the top of my building. So I have a rooftop thing and I love going up there when it's nice and it's warm outside. I'll go and I'll meditate a couple of times. I'll try and do a little bit, just five minutes in the morning. I don't yeah, like yeah. a big one in the morning. Um, and then I'll do another one in the afternoon. And it's usually just, you know, 10, 20 minutes, just sit there and just clear it. And it also makes me get up from my desk <laughs> because it's necessary yeah. to not yeah. forget to do that. Right. Um, yeah. And between, between the morning routine, literally, but even without the meditation, just not looking at my phone. So I'll get up at like eight and my team knows don't talk to me until nine 30. Mm-hmm. I've, I've completely designed my whole company to be like, cool. Cause you know, you get to a certain point, I'm sure, you know, the same thing where there is always a fire when you wake up in the morning and there's always some problem that you are apparently the only person in the whole world that can deal with. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. true. if you maintain the habit, when you're an early entrepreneur, you, you have this habit of being like, cool, let me check my email. And you know, you're almost like when you're, you're not to say a young entrepreneur, but that's what it is. You're really like hoping for emails. You're like, ah, hoping to get an email. Hope I got that message today. Woohoo. You know, you get a little bit further along. You're hoping that there's none, but they're always it. <laughs> you're like, yeah. ah, yeah. I don't want to deal with that. So don't look at the phone, meditate a little bit. And then the other stuff that I do is I go up into, so I'm I'm in Vancouver, as you know, and there's, we're about an hour and a half away from Whistler. They have these places up in Whistler there. It's called the, this one's called the Scandinavian spa. They take your phone and it's an outside thing where there's a whole bunch of hot tubs, a whole bunch of ice baths, um, Mm. cold baths, and they're all outside nestled in the mountains and there's cold waterfalls and cold, uh, and warm waterfalls. And so they do this, like, take your phone away, make everybody shut up. Right. And just do the rotate cold, hot therapy. Um, that is, I've ne- I never think clearer than when I come out of that. So I'll meditate there and I'll go there right from like 8am to 9pm, like a, like a complete psychopath, but <laughs> you do it like yeah. twice, once every couple of months. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that, um, you know, these things that we do as business owners, and I think that like sitting in front of your computer every single day, is almost like the new cigarette. Where you're just like, man, I got to sit here. I can't leave. And I'm just like, and you just tend to almost deteriorate. And so I think that like, it's a really good point. And I think too, like if anybody gets a chance and you're in Thailand or anything like that, and you do, or even India as well, but if you get an opportunity to spend some time in meditation, I think you shock yourself on what the benefits are in the long run. So I thought, I thought it was a really good point, but I think also during that time in 2017. Can we just say even before you move on, like culture yeah. guys. Go do the that's, damn shit. That's, that's what I was. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I think beyond, yeah, like, you nailed it. Whatever, yeah. Just like, you know, don't just travel to a place and be like, oh, here's a picture of me with a Buddhist statue and then fuck off. Like, yeah, go there long enough to, to meet the people. Because I would never have known how friendly these people were. I oh, never would have. Culture, right? Yeah. Right. Like, I, I don't yeah. want to. I always say the, the, there's a girl and boy version of it. And they laugh their ass off at me every time I try to do it. I say the wrong one. <laughs> So, yeah, so, 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 what so, so what is a cop is male. So what a ka is female. And, and it's, and it's sent, it's said by you It's first person. Hmm. Yeah. So I'd say cop. And then they say ka on the other side, which is kind of like plural in, in Spanish and in, in that, yeah. um, and, during that time and, uh, you were, you were traveling and, and I think that you're absolutely right about culture. Uh, anybody that wants to deal, uh, with anybody in the world, I found that it, it just did, even in this conversation, traveling, when you look at like no like and trust like mm-hmm. immediately we talk about you and i understand each other right like if there's an intimate thing that we both understand that we went there and, and that those kind of things bond people very quickly and i think in networking you have the ability to kind of cut through the cheese like really quick because you're vulnerable to things that you've been or places that you've been that you both understand because it's something like that you're kind of you're out of your comfort zone. I mean, the lady sent you your, you know, here's my motorbike and you're on your way, but you still didn't know if it's true. <laughs> you're just like, okay, I guess I'll, I'll listen to you. So that's awesome. Um, during that, uh, it seemed like you also had a sense of business uh, prior to that. 
Um, when, when did that business sense start for you? Were you someone in high school? Uh, were you someone in college early on? Where was that encouragement of saying, look, I can kind of maybe go make my own living or maybe create my own? My I have own always own. been, you know, maybe uniquely, and I hate, I hate this stupid entrepreneur story. Man, I started a lemonade stand when I was, you know, I get it. But like that really was like, I, we grew up a little bit on the poorer side. I grew up. So money was always something that I heard people just complaining about all the time, all the time. And so when I looked on TV, it was always who's making the money. It's, it's business people, right? It's the guys on TV. It's the guys who own the shit. And I'm like, okay, cool. So since I was young, it was always, I want to start a business. So I, I, I started a, and I mean, all the way back in middle school, I bought out the, the cafeteria chocolate bars and I'd go to the the schoolyard and I'd sell them for a profit. I'd do that shit. And in high school, I started a refurbished uh, electronics store on eBay. So I would buy this stuff from a drop drop shipping before it was drop shipping that were refurbished like TVs. And I'd sell them <clears throat> admittedly for full price <laughs> on eBay as if they weren't refurbished TVs. Um, and sure, I made sure. a little bit of money doing that. And then I put myself through university um to, to to get my bba um by flipping cars and i did that enough to where i owned a dealership by the time i was out of it and then i used all that kind of information i majored and in, in, had honors in marketing um and started a marketing agency once i came out here very cool and, and i'm assuming that is that is that around the 15 and 17 year 15 17 year 15 17 what do you mean 2015 2017 oh, no i started the this agency my my original agency was calculated marketing services that once housed up in vancouver it still exists it, it was started back in 2013 was when that one Got started it. yeah yeah that transition in, in 13 um that was that was kind of the years uh, that were i mean obviously is before some of the softwares that we have now mm -hmm. um when you made that transition um it's funny we we both have a lot of the same background. I think the the more business owners that I meet, we we all kind of have this cloth that we go through. You know, I did I did the Starburst and the Snickers and the <laughs> I did those things, you know, it's like you think I we did the lanyards and the plastic things in like fourth grade. And yeah. I remember I remember I I I bought a pound of weed and I I remember I there were there were dime bags and then there were nickels. Mm -hmm. And I remember I packaged the whole thing up and then I was walking and I just didn't have the balls to actually sell it. So I, never, that's, I don't that's know if I would the of most entrepreneurs that we don't talk about. There's other stuff that we do to make money when we had to do it, but you know, dude, it's the funniest thing. I, I, I always look back and I'm like, you know, your ideas are good, but your execution was horrible. <laughs> there was definitely consequences, but when yeah. you went into going into the marketing space at that time, uh, did you find yourself going after, cause at the time it was, well, 13 were coming out. Uh, people are starting to kind of take heed. Uh, email marketing was powerful back then. Um, dude, Facebook. Honestly, uh, it, it was a wild ride, dude, back then. It was. Like, back when then. you think about right now, it's like, okay, well, what's the main issue? It's actually standing out, right? Which might sound like a problem. It's like, oh, it's a red ocean. It's a red ocean. Yeah, every niche is a red ocean. Figure out a way to stand out and be better. But back then, it was convincing them that they even needed that shit or what it even was. Like, it, the, my struggle was you need a Facebook profile, right? You need to even like really understand that you need your Google, your, your face, your, your website ranked on Google. You need a Facebook page. You need to be posting. The struggle was even making them see the value of those things. And so we were doing like, I mean, at the time I just started out, this is when I was brand, brand new. It was, you come out of business school and you've got a bunch of stupid ass theories and, and, and like the four P's of marketing and all this crap that you think you're going to just put to use for businesses. And it's going to be amazing. If I had, if I could go back, I wouldn't have done it. I would have just started a business and just, if I could give myself four extra years of doing it, as opposed to all the theories and stuff, I really didn't put it to use until now that I have a company with 20 plus employees and all this crap. Right. But the struggle was, yeah, convincing them to be on it, doing posts and them seeing the value of it, doing email marketing, doing SEO so they rank. And uh, it was just such a wild ride, man. It was really the Wild West, even back then. That wasn't even like the brand, brand new part. Like my business partner, Rahul, he started back in 2004 selling like banner ads from custom creatives, which is even more wild. So it's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the people now, at least when you walk up to a person, they know they need your services. They probably already use somebody to do it. They know they need to be online. They understand the value of it, but they 
They just need to see that you're the one to do it. They need your, they need certainty in you and your product as opposed to Tom, Dick and Harry down the road. So it's a completely, I think you bring up a really good point. And I think that, you know, it probably was intentional, but not intentional is that it, a lot of people will say like, oh, back then it was so much easier. (laughs) And I think that what I think that you're bringing up is a very good point. And that is there was objections back then that you had that were not today that mm-hmm. you think would have been a lot easier you're con- you're you're literally trying to tell someone to drive a car when they've had a, a horse and they're just like oh, i don't even know what this makes any sense and i'm afraid of it because i don't understand if i hit the gas what do you mean i can't kick it on the side there's this there's this idea that you know you just don't really understand it so it's convincing and i think that that comes down to the ability I, I go back, I was in the car business as well. Um, but when I go back and you look at it, there was some cloth that was there. The way we sell is different than we used to in the car business. Um, yeah. But there's really some underlining fundamentals that will never go away, or maybe they will with AI, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But still, we're emotional creatures in the way that we make decisions. And so I think that's a really good point that if you ever are starting out now, you're going to have to overcome whatever that is in front of you the same way that people would have 20 years ago. I think that's Honestly, it. That's- I think, I think it's important to understand that like, it's not, it wasn't easier then. it's, it's, I think it's easier now, right? Because what you need to do is actually be good at a thing. I guess that makes it harder, but if you're good at a thing now, it's way easier because the people around you aren't. Yeah. There's a lot of them, but 90% of them are no good. And everybody knows they need your service. So if you make an offer that's good enough and you can articulate it in a way that gives them certainty that you can do it for them, they're going to buy from you because everybody right now, everywhere, especially right now, everyone's saying the same thing again. Oh, recession's coming. Money's getting tight, et cetera, et cetera. Well, no, recession's coming and money's getting tight means they need more business. So if you're a marketing agent, they need you now more than they ever needed you before. So as long as you can say, I can do this thing in a language they understand and you can articulate it in a way that gives them certainty that you can do it, easiest time to be able to do that stuff. Easiest time to find a client. And people's minds shift. Um, you know, uh, I have a small agency on the backside of our stuff as well. I've had it for a long time. And um, we did these things called website standout packages. And we basically just would rent out and we just manage them and send them out and things like that. And I had a client of ours uh, contact me. And he's like, hey, man, you know, we got Facebook now. And he's like, I just want to cancel our website. And I was like, huh? like, okay, that's fine with me. But like, you've been with me for, what is this, five, six years? Like, what are you going to do? I'm just not going to have one. I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> this is probably not the smartest thing to do. But in his mind, he really thought that Facebook, it was going to now be his thing. And he just canceled the whole thing. And I, and I think that there's a percentage of people that need to understand some people just can't, you're not going to convert everybody. Mm -hmm. And they're at a stage and at a season in their life where they make specific decisions that sometimes make no sense. Well, people are are like crows, right? They fly around and they're like, oh, shiny object, shiny object, shiny object the whole time that i mean that to me sounds have you ever read, read the book i'm uh, good to great by jim collins ever read that book yeah, but i used to own a condo in vegas and i used to read i used to put on the audio of good to great <laughs> perfect and i you, and i think a great guy, example that guy the flywheel that he talks about in that book mm-hmm. right that's what this guy's mm-hmm. doing he spent five years with you pushing the wheel in one direction and for everybody out there that that doesn't know what I'm talking about, the flywheel concept in that book is think of it as like a giant, giant, heavy, heavy wheel. And every time you push it, it moves a tiny little bit. But if you keep pushing it in the same direction all the time, eventually every spin looks like it's just spinning the giant, super heavy wheel 10, 20 times. And if you come in and you look at it, you'd be like, oh, well, how the how is that guy so strong? Right. But you don't see the thousands and thousands of pushes in one direction consistently that did it. And, and what you're talking about, Jason, now is that guy being like, cool, let me just grind that wheel to a halt, adjust it over here to the right and start slowly pushing on it again. And I think, you know, the worst part about shiny object syndrome, we, we have an 80-20 rule specifically for our business. 80% of all resources go into accelerating the things that are already proven to work. 
anything that we want to test, any shiny objects, anything at all, it's always capped out to 20% of the resources until it's proven itself. And then you can start to, to put more in. And that, that keeps us, in my opinion, constantly pushing the, the flywheel in one direction while still being able to maybe test out if other things are worth our, our, our effort. And people like that guy that worked with you just grinds it to a halt that he's going to find out real quick, even if it does work, like everything in business, it won't go off right away. It'll take consistent effort in one direction. And you're just, you know, moving horizontal at that point. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that opens up a, a conversation about shiny object syndrome. Um, which we all have it, get over yourself. <laughs> no one's subjective. We all like cool shit, right? <laughs> so it's like, ah, but look at it. This is, it's, I think it's scarier in today's environment. Um, looking at the past couple of years, you've got Bitcoin. Great. I mean, great, great thing that's going on. It's amazing. It's an amazing, um, tool and an amazing process and, and an amazing implementation to, how we can defy and do a bunch of cool stuff, right? But then you have a massive crash on something that's so volatile, NFTs. Massive crash on on NFTs, and and and. But they they even structured it saying, look, they'll have utility. That they have terminology. Um, but now we go into something like AI. Now, this one's interesting. Would we be feeling the same when Bitcoin came out? Because the conversation was, this is what's going to take over the world. And then NFTs, this is what's going to take over the world. So in this context, what, what, how do we, with knowledge of what just happened to the other ones, how do we address AI in a healthy way? This is where what you said the first at the first point, which is we're all guilty of it, comes into play. Um, because we're in the moment right now where it's coming out. So it's hard to disassociate yourself with it and be like, oh, yeah, no, it's going to be one of those things. Because like the bi the biggest thing that I, I remember for the latest shiny object thing that was a completely hilarious flop was um uh, oh, what was it called? That that audio only app. What is that called? Club Clubhouse Clubhouse was just went off for like people were paying people for invite, like literally like I will pay you any amount of money. I'll give you five thousand dollars to get an invite. So that I can hop on this thing and it fizzled out within a month. It was, it was, but I've, it's, it's probably within the last 10 years, the biggest, weirdest, like in the moment fad I've ever seen like that, where everybody was chasing it down. Everybody had built marketing strategies around it. And then it went away. Now with the, the AI stuff, how, how have you used it a bunch? Have you used a bunch of the tools? Yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been, I've been trying to dedicate a couple hours a week to just kind of being like, mm, like, at least me not, at least I can have conversations, right? And and yeah. kind of see where I'm gonna move them forward. There are things that has helped. I mean, you know, podcast creation, I can give my team, uh, I can give them more leniency to say, can you use these tools to create content to then maybe use that in the distribution of these podcasts? Now that takes someone that has a job in editing, has somebody that has a job in design, um, and they can put that together, but they would have had to wait for someone like me or a content writer that we have on the team to actually finish the project. Now you have that in your delivery process and your SOP. Now I can actually be like, Hey, if I can get this thing at 80%, let's crank out more volume. Uh -huh. And I'm probably not going to have somebody write it. So there's, I, I, I'm already starting to use it in that. I guess I just told you how I'm using it. I'm literally using it like that. Yeah. <laughs> We got, I mean, we're using it for like, like it, it, it's all about, to me, it's all about the prompts. And so I'm trying to learn, I'm, I'm watching a bunch of videos and seeing just the way people are doing it. Got to love TikTok. It, it, I've always found if I want to learn something about TikTok, if I just make sure I rewatch whatever video I think gives me the right advice three or four times, the algorithm's like, here's a million more of those exact unique videos. So like, okay, cool. So I'm studying the prompts. I'm doing that. Because if you just, the people who I think don't think it's going to be any good are the ones who say, hey, write me this thing and it spits out something generic. They don't understand that you can tell it things like make it snarky, right? And add this. Write thing. it like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. And it'll change the way that it says it to your, to what you want. And I'm doing things like topic stuff. So I'm asking it to come up with topics, metaphors, themes for stuff. And then I'm giving it what I wrote. So I give it like an ad that I wrote personally that I know did really well. And I'm like, cool, now take that information and write something like this. And it spits out something 
like you said, probably 80% as good as I would do it. But now you can spit out volume, whereas you might have needed, you know, a copywriter and a media buyer per every like eight accounts as an agency, Mm -hmm. right? You could do probably 100 accounts now with just the same people and still be able to pump out a volume of creative that makes sense at a high scalable budget. And then there's this weird shit. Like if you go look at my profile, I did a, I, I used one AI tool to make a picture of a, a cyborg Gandalf from the Lord of the Rings. And then I used another AI to get it to, to, to bring it to life and say something that I say all the time, which is no amount of traffic will fix your shitty offer. And I just made the, the weird animated Gandalf say that thing. And I, the, just, the, just the thought that you could write the, the script on one, make a weird picture of whatever you can think of to say, and then animate that, bring it to life to say whatever you wanted to say is just nuts. To me, it's crazy. Is it a shiny object thing? Probably a lot of it. But I think other things like what I said about the ads and increasing your volume and stuff, I think it's going to be a tool that is going to change the way that a lot of this business is run in the next year or so. It, it already has, like there's already people doing it. Yeah. The, the integration, um, because at the end, at the end user doesn't care. I mean, let's say that, you know, you're in the pool business or something like that. And, you know, you, you, you generate an AI response. It's not much difference in theory. We've kind of had prompts on phones for years. Yeah. hundred oh, yeah, percent. I mean, it's, you know, it's, I mean, it, it press one, I mean, in a way, it's press one, and then it goes to a different conversation. Press two, you're going to get a different conversation. So we it's almost have prompted things. That's it. I think the tool, the fact that it's a tool that integrates as opposed to a shiny object that you have to completely shift. Ah, uh, very good. You know, the best one that I heard was that uh, ChatGBT is to fo- to artists as Photoshop was the transition. Mm. Yeah, and I thought that was like a really good. Like you still are going to want a designer. Mm-hmm. But you could go and learn Photoshop, but there's someone that's a good designer. It's just, they, this is cool. They have that style. They got something about them. And you still have to be able to put the input to come out like that. And that brain still takes creativity. Though mm-hmm. one thing I thought that was very cool about AI is that I could go in there and have it right. And it gives me the foundation, almost like, hey, I, I have clay. I want to make a bowl but I, I, I want to be able to put the colors on it. And basically what I find it does is it goes, all right, here's the clay, creates the bowl. And now I don't take all that time going, okay, what's the shape? Do I have to measure it? It just goes, bloop, and then I can actually put my touch on it. I've, I've done that. Like, so there's a couple of like longer form posts that I've done recently that are all like 80% written by chat GPT. And mm-hmm. literally the process I went through was get, come up with a few metaphors for these people who want these scenarios. Cool. Now write me a long form post in this style using that metaphor. And then I take that, like you just said, and then rewrite it my own way. But now the, the skeleton is there. It makes it, the frame yeah. is there. Now it's, it takes half as much time, if even, right, to be able to do it. I um, wanted to dive in a little bit because I think that um, I try to do my homework as much as possible and um, try, to, try to learn people in the way that they think. And one of the things that I think would be very valuable because I, I watch a lot of how your posts are in some of them, um, And I think I had something here was, uh, you know, um, how I went from broke (laughs) POS. That's not point of sale. I don't think it was to overnight (laughs) success. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, went from a a broke, uh, POS to an overnight success, got off my ass, worked at it for 10 years. That's it. That's your story. Um, one of the things I think that I wanted to bring up is that there's a difference between conversion and attention. And I think that attraction or whatever those two, and how do you look at those two in, um, in, in kind of bucketing those separately? Because I think a lot of people really struggle with the mindset of what you're trying to do on the front end compared to when you get in on the back end and you convert someone on more or less the sales side. So I would say a couple of things. One attention comes first, conversion comes later. Um, and you need, you need the attention. So we separate our, our whole strategy in the, in, the, in the program that I run, right? Get shit done is we have two buckets. One is called conversion content. And that's where we have different variables that are getting people to raise their hand or DM you directly or say, hey, I want that thing. I want your services. That's the take, right? And then we have um, teach them how to think content, which is completely based around teaching your audience to think differently 
about you, your product, your service. So uh, if you've ever read um, uh, anything by Jordan Belfort, right, <laughs> for his sales books and that kind of stuff, he talks about the three tens, right? And how anybody will buy anything from you if they're 100% 10 out of 10 certain in that your product is going to provide the, the end result that they want, that your company is going to put their needs above its own, and that you are the person to actually deliver that. And so the content around teaching how to think is based around that. It's teaching them how to think differently about you. It's teaching them how to think differently about their common mindset issues that they usually come into the sales calls with. And it's teaching them how to reverse their common objections that they might run into. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I want the attention to be doing. I want to be teaching them. I want to be giving them stuff for free. I want them to be so happy with me that by the time anybody asks them for anything, they either say, if I had any money in my wallet, I would of course give it to you because you've given me so much for free. Or they just take out their credit card and swipe right away because they're like, yeah, of course, man, if you've given me all this, I can't wait to see what could possibly be on the other side. And so it, it's almost like gamified attention that eventually becomes a conversion. And so we're filling up the value bucket. We're filling up the, the, the feelings bucket. We're filling it all up so that when the conversion content comes around, which is, hey, just did this thing. Do you want it? Right. Or, Hey, we're rolling out this launch or this offer or this helpful piece. Do you want it? And then we take a little bit from it. They're like, okay, of course. And so gamifying the attention all the way to developing a relationship and all the way to then eventually, you know, eventually creating that, that high ticket sale. That's huge. And that's something we've, we've done, you know, I'm teaching a lot recently. We've kind of flipped some shit on its head. Um, instead of raising our prices, we went down. We created a low ticket thing because we, we attract and everybody attracts. Look, we, I run not only my company stuff, but we run some of the marketing departments for some bigger coaches as well. And the biggest thing is no matter what you do, 80% of your leads can't afford right away high ticket stuff. They're not ready for that yet. And so most people are throwing away money and audience and all this stuff. And they're just like chasing and raise your prices, raise your prices, what everybody says all the time, but you're leaving a lot of people behind. And, and I felt like we needed to structure it in a way where we have a product that actually meets where the majority of our customers are. What a crazy idea. Mm -hmm. um, and that's built in to take that first couple of steps. And that's part of that, what you're saying, you know, gamify that attention, create a nurturing system that brings them forth and then, and then use the other content to, to convert on the back end. Some of the things that I noticed too, and some of the things that I kind of see is that at the end of the day, a lot of these people, you know, a lot of times the high ticket in a sense that it's very slow. And sometimes mm -hmm. in a case where you, you know, maybe someone who get like four sales or maybe five sales for the month, um, the volume is actually very difficult to, to create a system because you're, you don't have much volume. And I come from originally, I came on the internet, I was in the e-commerce business and the volume always felt a little bit of security because you could actually move the volume because it has a rhythm to it. And if you don't have something that's an input, that's going to kind of come in consistently, you really don't have any fish to feed off of. And so I think you make a really good point on, and maybe economically, maybe we're there too. Um, mm -hmm. But just to allow people to come into your, um, into your ecosystem and kind of case in point, and we were talking about him earlier, um, you know, Frank Kern, he, he runs an ad and he runs an ad. It's a $4 bundle. That thing's been running for like, I'd say like 10, like so long. That thing's just been running and running and running. And he, and he brings these people into his ecosystem. And I think that there's, maybe you can touch on this a little bit. Do you think it's, um, it's ego? Do you think it's a fear of never, of, of wasting their time? Or do you think it's, I don't have the mind. I don't have the map minded out in my head that's going to see, okay, I'm going to put an offer here on the 12th. I'm going to put an offer out here on the 17th. I'm going to put an offer on the 22nd of the month, but everything else is built up to that offer. What, how do you see that? Why people really pull back because, and I'll just kind of one point, there was a time in business and you would go probably nineties, two thousands, not even two thousands. Like I, I'd say like before the internet, it was like never lose money. Mm. right to get the customer always be closing don't let them leave grab as much money as you can and there really was no reparosity it, it was conversion mm -hmm. you know so what's your what's your thoughts on p on the way people's minds should be thinking about that process 
I, I like to start by saying, I think the one, the problem that I see a lot of people going through right now is that they're always focused on chasing the higher high and, and that mm. creates a lot of the issues. What I mean by that is like, if, if, if like you're going like this, you're like, Oh, get this big one. And then a couple other ones and Oh, they get this big one. And it's those ones right afterwards where everybody gets all depressed. And so it comes into play with what you were saying there with the inconsistency of high ticket sales with some of these people where you get just a few of them each month and you're not building that stuff up behind you, right? I tell people, and we teach people in all of the stuff that we do to, to reverse that thinking, flip it on its head, stop chasing a higher high, start wondering how can I raise the floor? How do I set a higher low consistently with everything that I do? And I love that you, you talk about the Frank Kern thing. And that's the thing, Frank Kern is generating customers every time he's not generating leads and freebie seekers he's finding even if it's a dollar that you pay me you're now a customer that 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 ice has been broken the relationship has progressed that is always going to be infinitely more valuable than somebody who is just a free email that you're never going to be able to contact again unless they get into some part of your your thing and what he's doing with that is he's creating number one he's monetizing his leads. He's creating free, free leads by getting them to pay for themselves. That raises his floor. And I know he has some low ticket products as well, which again, creates another baseline. And those people are now your best possible prospects, your best possible leads that you could ever have. And so a lot of people come into it with the mindset of like, okay, I got to do these multiple launches per month. They all have to be high ticket. I'm just going to do the sales at this point. I'm going to do that. So, because that's what everybody's been saying. Right. For the last year, if you look at some of the biggest names in the space, they're just yelling, raise your prices. Well, high ticket customers are easy, just as hard to close or just as easy to close as low ticket ones. You'll spend less time on them. They'll complain less. You'll have more time because they'll be all of those things logically at the surface are true. But who's 90 percent of your audience? And how often are you chasing a higher high because you're having a few, one really good launch where you sold a bunch of them and then a couple other ones that if you really look at it, you know, you didn't come down as far as the last time. So that's good, but you don't see it that way because everybody is screaming at you, raise your prices and everything will be fine. Chase that higher revenue thing because you saw Tom, Dick and Harry down the road on Facebook with their highlight reel who told you they made, you know, 200 K last month, but didn't tell you they spent 160 to do it. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah. I I think that leads into the the question I think that comes up. And that is that when you, when you find somebody that, you know, the idea is, you know, you'll see these on all of his, like, Oh, all you need is two thirty two a day. You know, all I need is $800 a day, whatever that is. And you can get to your million two, you can get to whatever that is. Right. Whatever mathematical. Yeah. But when, what I see though, is that when you say those kind of things, what is the number that you're finding that's actually changing people's lives? And I kind of was having this conversation with somebody and I was like, dude, like, do you realize like if you added another 15 grand a month, like you have a new car. Right there, there, right there, right there, man. God, just like that shit. That is, I I learned from somebody, I can't remember who it was. um, The concept this, this last couple of years, and I've, I've made it like a fucking, North Star. I hope you can swear on your podcast because I can't help. I don't give a fuck. Have, Game on. <laughs> I have East Coast blood in me, man. I can't. I can't I help don't it. Give a shit. Up? Game on. I like real people. That's really who you are. Let's roll. Well, I mean, we just gotta get shit. shit done, right in the right in the yeah. I mean, and you know, and, and it wasn't it, it wasn't point of sale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. But this is the thing when I, we, and we have had probably 300 plus people come through. Um, and every time I ask them, I'm like, what do you want to make? Like 10 K a month, 50 K a month, hundred K a month. I'm like, cool. Why? Oh, I don't know. I heard Jason say on his podcast last week. I thought that was cool. You know, it's like, well, well th- this is the problem. Right. And so we've come up with, we learned this from somebody else and it's the solvable problem concept. This is, I just like that word. But we always did this where it was like, have a goal, work your way backwards. Cause we, we track and we have color coordinated spreadsheets and forms and stuff that they fill in. And it tells them you either did enough outreach or you didn't, you booked enough calls or you didn't, you closed enough calls, you showed enough calls so that we know exactly what bottleneck to help them fix. But my point is when you say an arbitrary number, it doesn't mean anything to you. You end up being like that guy. And I think a lot of us and a lot of your listeners have been this person where you roll out of bed one day, you're like, oh, man, you know what? It's January 1st. I ate a lot of fucking turkey over the last couple of weeks. I feel out of shape. I want to work out. 
And so, okay, for the first two or three weeks of, of January, I'm like, I just want to lose more weight. I want to eat better. And so you kind of do, but you're not tracking any of it and you don't have a number or a thing or any kind of North star. And so, you know, beginning of February, it gets fucking cold and you get sick. And so once you're sick and it didn't really, you don't know, like, did it work? I still kind of have a gut. I mean, I don't got a six pack yet. So obviously it didn't do exactly what I wanted to do. And you never work out again. And a lot of people go through these things where it's like, I want to make 20 K a month and I'm at like two or three K right now. And they'll start the process and then they won't get anything or they won't hit their goal within the first you know month and a half and they'll do the same thing as that that fat guy who said fuck it and i'm not going to work out anymore then they just give up and when you have a solvable problem and we go through this whole process with them like what do you are you working a a job right now cool we got to replace that income do you have aspirations of, of lifestyle travel shit you want to do every so often you know have a kid whatever that might look like a new house that you got to save up for cool now on the business side do you want to be able to make an impact do you want to have employees like what is your goal is it freedom is it scale is it impact all of these things have different numbers and we come up with a number for them and then that and the the difference between the people who have that and then use what we call is it our, our, our client student success tracker. And that's the thing that tracks all those numbers the way back they put inputs in every day. Um, and, but having that and then tracking the progress. So, you know, Hey, I lost a couple pounds out of the 20 pounds I wanted to, wanted to lose. I've lost two or three and it was from doing these tasks each day. So I know I'm mm-hmm. making progress and momentum is building. You'd be amazed sure. at how much better those people do. And so I love that. I love that you brought that up because like you said, you know, when they have a number that matters, right? A number that they've worked out and attaches to. And that number is like the fucking first phase one finish line of like, this is when my life gets better. This is when it's the better. Thing- yeah. Your, your life. I think that I wanted to bring it up because you had made a comment and this was actually a little bit of yours. And it was like, forget fuck you money, build a fuck you business instead. Mm-hmm. And it was a comment that you had made. And I, I thought that it would uh, attach really well with you. And I think that if you look at the numbers, the percentages of people that make over $100,000 a year is very, very, it's not very small. I mean, it's not very big. When you get up to the four hundred dollars to $450,000 a year, you're at 1% of the whole, the whole pie. Mm-hmm. You're at like 1%. It's like 456 or something like that. And when we attach it to actual assets, you would have yourself a brand new Escalade. I mean, you, you know, you, if you if you added another 20 grand, if 10 grand, whatever, you, you literally could add another vehicle. And I'm only using a vehicle because it's tangible. Yeah. But you could use, you could literally have a new car. And when you talk about status, because would, would you agree that it came down to status? You know, it's yeah. like, hey, if I make 100,000, I'm going to be able to get the house, live by the beach, get the car, get the, and then there's a status that I'm going to get from it. But there's a lot of status points before you, like there's a bunch well, of them. You might have bought a new watch or maybe you weren't getting a haircut. <laughs> you go get haircuts. <laughs> well, I mean, but it's, it's like when you actually go through this thing with people, I tell people like uh, another thing that I say all the time is build and act as if, right? So you're going to build and act as if you're already the person and or company that you want to become so that the structure and the bones is all there and you just kind of, you grow into it. And when I go through that process of like, cool, let's envision what that actually looks like for you. You'd be surprised how many times that it's like, we don't get to that point. Cause what are you doing? What do you actually want? Oh, well, I want freedom. Okay. Then you're drawing a straight line between freedom and more money and more clients, but you're wrong. Right? And here's yeah. the reasons you're wrong. So let's rethink that process because more money. Okay. Well, more money doesn't necessarily mean more profit. And then the straight line from more clients to more money, to more freedom. Well, more clients means more work. So if you want the freedom, that would mean more employees, which means also not necessarily more freedom, which means more management. And so you structure this now, build and act as if by working your way down, it's always, what is it that you want and work your way backwards from how you need to make that all happen. And then you can make it happen. And then just don't give up. Just be the most irritating POS, as we've said, that's ever existed in the fact that all you can see is that end goal and everything else you're going to shrug off because that's, that's just how it's going to work. And, and I find, yeah, the more people do that, the, the better it is because you know, everybody else it's, it's the people who just want to make that arbitrary number. Like I just want to be rich and I want to get that escalated and I just want to, I want to live in the penthouse and I want to be that guy. It's like, well, I don't know if you're going to make it, man, because I don't know if that's actually what you want. 
I think you just heard that I've, a lot. I've, I've used this analogy before and I, and I always go back to it. Um, and that is that you always imagine the farmer and, you know, the farmer basically is out there, he's farming his crops. And then maybe you see him at like a wedding and you're like, dude, that guy's loaded. Right. And it's like, yeah, he's loaded. And he's sitting there and he's got his ugly shoes on and he's just in the background, you know, and his crops come to, um, you know, um, come to fruition. And he's able to do it. He doesn't take his crops and like go down the street and he's just sitting there. And go, the guy's a farmer. He gets back up in the morning and starts to, you know, plow his land. He starts to, he's a farmer is what he is. And I think that there's a part of our society that we are missing on what is it that you really are doing? When I was in the e-commerce business, um, I owned 70 e-commerce stores at one time. And eventually I got into the point was like, what business am I really in? Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't in the sunglass business. That's not what I was in. I wasn't in the motorcycle chopper business. That's not what I was in. I wasn't in the watches business. No, nah, that's not what I was in. I was in the product delivery business. And if I could find products that matched to the delivery that I had, then I would add those products. And so I think that in this conversation, people need to become who that really is and then live that part of it. And then money will come from that fruit, right? It'll be, it'll, it should nurture um, from there. I think um, another thing, and I can kind of bring it on another topic. Um, you had said a little while back, and it was like, I'm going to go into put together. This is, uh, I wanted to hear kind of your take on this because I think, uh, somebody in the big world is doing it uh, very clearly right now. And I'm sure we'll be able to pull his name out here in a second. I know who it is, but I'll play with it. Um, I'm going to put together some free information on using social media and online marketing to make more money and want your input. Why do people not do that more often? Do you feel, why don't, why don't they say, what do you really want? Uh, I think, Two, two, two things. One, because they actually don't know how to answer those questions. And so they don't have enough knowledge yet to actually provide answers on the fly like that. Um, and two, because they're just scared, man. A lot of people just want to, to not put themselves out there. Yeah. And I try to tell my students, I'm like, look, a lot of you guys are like, ah, oh, you write good copy. You show up on camera. Good. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Go back in like two, three, four years ago. Watch those videos. They're all over the internet. I didn't take them down. I was talking yeah. to myself talking to myself and I was talking to myself like an idiot with a shitty camera. And like, I was just like, had a worst suit you could ever see brought it home from Thailand, by the way, yeah, <laughs> buddy. Ever seen, right. And I was just sitting there talking, man. I was just spitting shit. And you know, I tell people all the time, like, look, that still, I think one of the videos, like five, five years ago, I've lost complete track of time now through COVID. I have no idea. A lot of years ago, um, I did those videos, thought I was talking to myself, got like one like per video. And I, I don't think them. I've ever, I've never done this. But let's see what happens. <laughs> I think it shares context. There you go. Where, oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Look at that beauty. Look at that. Right. Sitting outside. We set that up on a tripod. Look at that shit. That's fantastic. Right? So, so we're shooting it. it was I, actually wanted to, I, want, I didn't want to put, I wanted to put in context your confidence that you have today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. No. And I mean, that, that actually might've been the video because that guy was working for me, the guy that was doing that at the time. And we closed a 20 K a month FinTech app company, um, uh, management fee for our agency back 20 K a month back then. I was like, fuck yeah, man. That's, I that was like, God status. I thought at the time I'm like, hell yeah. yeah. And they yeah. referenced those videos. They referenced actually that might've, that was the fireside chat. I think we did out, out on the thing. And we, I mean, don't listen to that but watch it, but don't listen to the shit that was in it. But that <laughs> alone, just getting comfortable, just talking to myself yeah. was it closed that deal. They referenced that video, They're like, Oh, your ideas and stuff. And that were really great. And that's why we, we chose you over blah, 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 whoever else was going into it. And so I tell people that story all the time, specifically because they're just scared to put themselves out there. Right. And so, I mean, but the problem is a lot of marketers, I don't know. Everybody teaches these strategies and they don't tell people how to be a marketer anymore a lot of the time. Mm. And so like everybody forgets to just ask their fucking customers what it is that they actually want. Right. And I, I tell people all the time, look, we, we, if you've, you've been clearly, you do your homework, which is fantastic. So you've definitely seen me say the word scary offer a lot. And I said this earlier, I made a whole robot picture of Gandalf to say no amount of traffic will fix your shitty offer. A lot of that 
people, they spend all month, all year, all day building the fanciest funnel they can think of, writing all this copy, trying to shoot a video over an offer that they presume will make sense for their people instead of spending the opposite amount, which is 90% of your time should be spent on, on your offer. And the number one thing about the offer formula that we use, which is the scary offer formula, the number one element that's probably the most important is customer language. It's going from I'm a digital marketer who generates Facebook leads using, you know, Facebook and I'll rank your thing on SEO and I'll do PPC mm. using a yeah. whole bunch of acronyms they don't understand or give a shit about and words that no longer mean anything. If I guarantee you 99% of the prospects you talk to, if you say you're getting them leads in their head, they just think work. Ah, that's a whole bunch of work with a whole bunch of shit that isn't going to do anything for me. And you're losing the deal right there. And it's because of your unwillingness to do like what you said, Jason, which is ask them, Hey, what do you want? Right. Mm -hmm. Go out and do what used to be an obvious staple of being a marketer of any kind, which was a customer survey, talking to groups of your, your, your desired avatar and literally asking them what it is that they want, their pain points, their desires in their own words. Right. People are afraid to do that now. Um, for whatever reason, uh, the person I'm talking about is if you follow this right now on Twitter, Elon Musk is doing it at the greatest level I've ever seen it. Twitter poll, Elon Musk plus Twitter polls right now. That's the best representation of, of, of this concept. <laughs> he literally is like, hey, by the way, do you want this? No. Hey, how much do you want to pay for a blue for a blue tick? Uh, you know, it's going to be $20. And they're like, oh, that's too much. How much will you pay? And they're like, he's like, OK, it's eight bucks. <laughs> <laughs> he's using it, right? He's using that. Yeah. Thing back and doing it it's it's yeah real time and amazing i wanted to also bring up uh, another topic and that was that as you were going through that you had mentioned right now you had an employee you were going through that thing and um i know it always also had raul on here and he's your business partner great guy uh, he had a lot of good things to say about you you have delivered which is awesome and in that i think that um what's your thoughts on people in this space because there's not there's not very many that you see out there that actually have partnerships or very solo entrepreneurs with teams and things like that. What was your de defining moment to make a decision to say, yes, we can be partners and do this. Um, and then maybe managing partnership. Uh, a lot of it's emotions. <laughs> that I, found. I mean, it, it, I, I wrote off. So uh, you, you brought up a couple of things about my past along the way. It was so when I talked about how I owned a dealership and shit, I sold it to a guy and I left and I came out here. Um, and it turns out the other guy was fucking useless, <laughs> ran into the mm -hmm. ground. Well, part of big part of it was a detail detailing bay we had in the back and we had a huge contract. Then immediately when I left, he uh, fucked off to Halifax and went to a casino and gambled for a week, lost the contract, lost a bunch of sales. And basically the business went under within like two months of me leaving. And I never got a cent of like, I got like 5,000 of like, 150,000 that I was supposed to get from the buyer. That's, that's how bad it ran into the ground, like right away. So when I tell that story on the post that you were referring to, it was basically, I came out here and I was, I was fucked. I just graduated. I thought I was graduating with a degree. I was coming out here with all this money and I was just going to launch right away. And it was literally, yeah, fuck you. Life was like, no, nah, no, nah, you, you need to be re humbled again. We're going to start from the, we're going to start back from the ground floor. I'm like, okay, cool. And so really was turned off from partnerships. I was like, I'm not, I'm not having any partners ever again, not, not going to be doing any of that shit. I can't trust this, these people, but with, uh, with Rahul, we did some work together. Um, and there was just really good opportunity. Our, our personalities match quite well, where we're just straight yeah, shooters. Yeah. Right. But our yeah. skill sets at the time also, like I'm, I'm very much a builder. I'm a builder, mm -hmm. ops guy, marketer. I can do sales because I'm articulate. I always say I'm not like, I'm not a sales guy trained. I'm just very confident and I can articulate well. Sure, and so I can sure. make you believe in whatever the fuck it is. And I'm trying and to it's been you. an evolution. It's been an yeah, evolution. But that's the thing. And he, he's a sales guy. Like he, his was the sales role. Um, and so we just, our, our strengths and weaknesses matched up really, really well. Um, and it just worked like the, the, look, I, I say I've been in a long-term relationship for a long time. I say the same thing about relationships, communication, man, is, is it, if you, if you can just not bullshit your partner, we're all salespeople. We're all marketers. We're hyperbolic. We say a bunch of shit. There's got to be some, some, some sprinkled in, you know, seasoning and everything, but with your partners and your, your relationships. And honestly, having a business partner, I talk to him probably just as much as I talk to my fucking wife at this point. Sure, it's the same sure. thing, right? So you got, you got to just be 
straight because if you let anything kind of bubble around or if you let anything get in there, it can really fuck shit up. And we've just, our personalities have always been like, we're straight shooters um, and we're just ourselves. And it's just worked really, it's worked really well. Yeah. I think that if you're going to go into a partnership, there has to be an underlying work ethic that you already have. Cause oh, you can yeah. almost, you can get through anything together. Like even in, in partnerships, you make a mistake, even if it's a big mistake, as long as the goal, and I mean, if you talk about relationships as well, kind of the statement is like, you know, you don't, I'm not confessing to be perfect at this. Let's go ahead and clear. <laughs> it. <laughs> I don't want my girlfriend out to be like, yeah, right. It's bullshit. No. <laughs> but I think that the line that I heard a long time ago is we're on the same page. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, uh, we're, sorry, we're on the same team. Yeah. So at the end of the day, what I think ends up happening, this is a great conversation about, about communication is that we're trying to win. Mm -hmm. and we're I trying think to that in conversation it's like no we're on the same team it's just I don't get it and I think that we also grow at different levels and at different mm -hmm. at different times and you know people that are in long-term marriages they always talk about the ability to forgive and the ability to allow the other person to grow at a different rate than you do mm -hmm. And that was a really hard one for me because some people just don't understand things. Wisdom is created by failure. And so people just really don't get to a point where they're like, hey, I didn't get that. I mean, male, men, men and women, we're, when we're young, right? And the girls start like getting older and you're like, we're left behind. <laughs> like, I'm such a <laughs> grody guy, you know? And then, and then yeah. they grow and then we kind of grow like this. So I think that that's a really good point is just keep communication. Don't hide shit. If it's, if it's fucked up, unfuck it together because a partner always wants you to, they want you to be on a level playing field because then you could actually deliver. Well, and that, that also says start. like, like the communication and, and then what you said kind of amplifies the fact that don't, don't keep score because at different times, different people are going to be doing more than the other because that's just how it goes. So some, sometimes you're going to need each other more than that. Sometimes one person's really going to be driving the boat, but remember like it, it, the, the problem, and I've seen a lot of people collapse. We come, we, we have a lot of people that come into our program that do really, really well. And sometimes the partnerships don't work out. And it, it's like what you just said, people grow at different rates. Sometimes one person, they start out here, but really quickly, they start to like the amount that one person is doing, the value they bring, and they start to keep score and they start mm -hmm. to really like overthink that, right? They forget that they, they both got to that place together and then it's okay mm. if one if one starts to do a little bit more and starts to become a big, you know, sometimes you just got to be okay with that. And a lot of people can't, right? It's when you start to overthink and overcomplicate stuff like that, instead of just visualizing the whole picture, like here's where we were and here's where we are now. It doesn't matter that like, this is where we were and now we're here and I'm doing this. And you're like, it, so the whole thing works, then the whole thing works. And so keep again, pushing that flywheel. But I've seen a lot of people collapse because of that. They start keeping score. And that really, as, we, that, yeah. as, we, as we go into 2023 um, and the internet and conversion, how, how do you see, or maybe you can encourage people in the mindset of the onslaught of things that we have going on, the onslaught of AI, the onslaught of recession, the onslaught of you know, eggs being nine freaking dollars, <laughs> you know, in, in that we as don't business talk about owners, the eggs, man, God, come on now. Dude, Costco, Costco, there's no eggs at Costco. I've no eggs. Give, there, will, there will be no eggs in my diet probably for another 12 months at this point. So I'm done <laughs> up on it. I went and got a chicken. So at least I can share three. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> teach a man. Not teach a man to fish, teach a man to farm, I guess it would be. But I think that there's maybe something. How do you see the marketplace? Um, what's your thoughts on the marketplace? Um, and what do you think that this is going to be an interesting? What's your thoughts of those that will separate themselves? Because these are separating times, unfortunately. Well, that, and that last part you just said is, is key. This, this is the golden opportunity for anything you want to do. Whether you want to invest, whether you want to innovate, whether you want to stand out from everybody else, two things are about to happen. Everybody's going to start cutting budgets and everybody's going to start getting fearful and everybody's going to start dropping off. Interestingly, in the coaching space, it's happened a lot. Like we acquired one, one other company who, who just got burned out, didn't want to do it anymore. Um, and at least three or four other people that used to be big in the space, either just stopped for like six months because they burned out or just straight up quit 
I'm not going to use the word retired because, you know, but Billy ruined that too. But <laughs> some people actually quit and did all that kind of stuff. Um, that's going to continue to happen, especially in the agency space. We had a really big boom and then we had a bit of a consolidation and we're going to about to have that same thing again, where we're having this boom and we're going to have another consolidation. Right. By consolidation, I mean, it's like, because there's a lot of people teaching a lot of people how to do a lot of things, they get to a certain point and they're like, ah, and they fall off and they conglomerate and all that kind of crap. So the biggest opportunities probably, and I'm going to look really deep into the camera now, all of you people listening to this in the future, literally the next 12 months are probably going to be the biggest opportunity of your life. And that's in literally every facet of, of it. Uh, my, my honest advice is anything that you're about to do, everybody is about to be fearful. And they're already fearful, but it is probably historically speaking, going to swing the pendulum back the other way at some point during this year. And if you're well positioned for that, as in you're building and buying while other people are being fearful to quote uh, Warren Buffett, right? In any aspect of, of your life, you're going to be well positioned for success. Now is the time to innovate and create an offer that actually convinces people that you're the one that can help them because they need the fucking help. Yeah. There's an analogy. They talk about cows run from the storm and buffaloes go towards it. I like that. <laughs> I've never heard that, but I like it. I think that um, it's not an easy thing. I think that there, what you just said nailed it. I think that I'll maybe add a little bit. And that is that if you, that's the difference between people that are willing to get in the fight and then the ones that aren't willing, and then you'll be separated. And, and it naturally has that. I think the one thing to kind of bring up too, is that all this fear we did, just went through COVID, went through that whole thing. That contraction happened right there as well. I don't know if there's ever been a time, well, maybe when you, maybe when you look back, you look at like swine, uh, not swine, we go back and look at the bird flu, you look at all this stuff. And then you had the war and you had all these things. We are nowhere near this point. But I think that when you when you look at this, I don't know if there's ever been too close, like Cohen, <clears throat> and then it was like, okay, everybody kind of do this, and then now we're only a year and a half. Yeah, and all it, of a sudden we're gonna. Like it's all been one thing to me. Like there was a little bump at ah. some point, really, but it feels like it's just like, and that's kind of why I feel like it's not. I don't. I think I think we're gonna look back at this and in a few years and be like, yeah, we were in a recession the whole time, and there was a hmm. fake a fake salvation from the refreshing you. for done by the money printer going burr that kind of made everybody feel like we weren't, but we've been in a recession since COVID hit. I think technically we've been there the whole way. And so we should come out of it at some point. And I think that's what that clarity, that kind of stuff is only for captain hindsight to show up and tell us about. Right. Mm -hmm. But I, I, that's my opinion anyway. And you talk about it on this, you know, you talk, we talked about in the beginning of this, um, we talk about a lot, it's called the monk's removal. And I continue, even as I'm getting older, I'm, I'm realizing how much I'm influenced and I'm like, God, man. And I, and I really am trying to even, you know, you got to uh, say, I don't like to say I'm an addicted person. I have a massively extreme personality, extremist personality. And so, but when I look back, I'm like, wow, you know, these are the times when, you know, if I can get some of this stuff, that's like, you really have control of what's going in your brain nowadays. You know, you're not, you're not just, if you go to your job, yeah, you had Bobby and you had Sally and they were talking about their family life and issues to be attached to that. But now when we do this thing right here, you really do have the ability to shut it off and it's not easy. I, uh, it's a lot harder than I thought. I, I sound like a weak, total pussy, but it's like, sometimes I'm like, I'm I back mean, on this thing. Every other person ever that's everywhere is also a weak pussy because it's the same thing. But if there's any addiction that everybody has right now, it's this thing. How many times a day can you, if, if I move away from this desk, I'll pick this up and look at my notifications. I will, because well, I mean, that's, it's an, ex, it's almost like I heard somebody Cyborg. describe it as an appendage. Now it's not mm -hmm. like a device. It's, it's an, it's an, that extent. was Elon Musk. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there you go. Wow. He did. He, he, he quoted that. He goes, we already are cyborgs. Mm -hmm. like, I mean, you can't, I can't go. This is, it's almost like a second brain. It's, it's your connection point to everything. It's, it's your device for work. It's, uh, it's, it's more powerful than they used. It's more powerful than the computers they used to use to run the world, et cetera, et cetera, cliche, cliche, but you get, it, it really is. I don't know. Is it even an addiction anymore? Or is it just a piece, a part of you? Like, at what point is it? Oh, that is just like, uh, just a, 
you're right. Is it even an addiction or is it just like getting coffee in the morning? It's just this flow. Yeah, but it's damaging. It's, There's certain things to your brain that are beautiful to take a step back. And well, I and mean, just, what did I say earlier? Why my my whole thing to not burn out? Don't look at my fucking phone for the first hour of the day, and then go to a place in the mountains where they physically remove my phone from me for the whole day. Like those are honestly the two two things that help me my my mental health the most. So I mean, I, I guess that's kind of telling on its own. Well, I'm going to tell you, I appreciate our time together. This has been an amazing podcast. Cody, I know that uh, you represent Get Shit Done, which I think represents you. You showed up. You did awesome. GSD mode, um, not point of sale. Went from point of sale, piece of shit, to success. <laughs> uh, what, what what would you like to maybe uh, give it as maybe somebody, the audience, um, with one last message to them? And then how do they find you, my man? Yeah. Uh, one last message to everybody is the thing that I've been repeating a few times. No amount of traffic will fix your shitty offer. Have a solvable problem, create a North star, and then get rid of the noise. Don't, don't look around at everybody else's chapter five and wonder why your chapter one isn't quite doing it. Right. So just put your head down, do the work, take imperfect action and get shit done. That's how you succeed. That's the only way to do it. And if you want to find more of me, uh, we give away, a literal shit ton of free knowledge, probably more than you'd pay $10,000 to from other people. Trust me, I've paid a lot of money to a lot of people. We usually just give it all away for free. Go to joingsd.com forward slash group. Joingsd.com forward slash group and you can uh, check us out. I appreciate our time together. It's been a fantastic uh podcast well ooh, we also have him that was on here go back and look at that as another episode so everybody back there make sure you like and subscribe on this episode when it releases i appreciate your time and you made it through an episode of moved entrepreneur vault thanks a lot brother appreciate it. if you like this episode make sure you smash the like button and subscribe to the youtube channel just like nike is to athletes moved is to entrepreneurs